Yes. So, Steve, welcome to Founders Club. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Appreciate your time. And, um, you know, I know that you're you're kind of known as a, a, a relationship builder. You've got one of the best Rolex uh, Rolodexes in the game. And uh, I definitely want to get into all that, but maybe give us just a quick background on on Bluefish and kind of how you built that and, and all that. Wow. Um, I was a aggravated bricklayer from East London uh, that was poor. Um, I was poor financially. I was poor in mindset. And I couldn't understand how I would wake up in the morning at four o'clock, go home at eight o'clock, work in a hard day, but I wasn't getting anywhere. So I, I needed to understand how do you work smart rather than hard. And so I decided to go out on a journey to try and find people that were, let's be serious, at the time, rich. Because as a kid, all you want is to be rich. You know, you don't want to be successful or wealthy. You want to be rich. There's a monetary behind it. So I went out to try and find those people, um, and I couldn't communicate with them. Uh, it's funny that you talk about building relationships when I'll say straight at the, uh, straight at the front, I was probably the worst person in the planet. Um, but I realized the necessity, and that's why I started focusing on it. Um, and so what I did was I wanted to hang around with people that was wealthy and successful and affluent. And I thought, if I'm going to get in that sandpit, I've got to bring something to the party. Now, one of my jobs, one of my low, low points of life, or I thought, was I was the doorman of a nightclub. Well, when you're the doorman of a nightclub, you know all the other nightclubs. You know where all the private parties are. You know where the premiers are. Anyone that needs a security guard, they look for a big, scary, ugly dude. It was me. So I knew where all of these things were going on. So I could actually go to the rich people I knew and go, hey, are you going to the so-and-so's fashion party? Or are you going to the opening of that new club? Or are you going to that, you know, Cartier's opening party? Are you doing any? No. Let me see if I can help you. And I literally did it just so that I could get you into that party, gain a connection, but more importantly, get a couple of hours off of you the following day and just go, hey, been meaning to ask you, Johnny, you know, how do you get in a business or how do you build relationships or how do you look at proposals or how do you raise capital? How do you do social? All of those kind of things. I was podcasting before podcasts existed, but me doing the front end stuff, it was only ever to get that two hours. And that was the main focus. I've always told people that as Bluefish grew into what was the world's most successful experiential concierge firm for billionaires and millionaires, it was a Trojan horse. Hey, if you want a, a, a drum lesson with Guns and Roses or a piano lesson with Elton John, sure. But my focus was two things, to get paid and to get two hours commitment out of you a couple of days later where I could have lunch, dinner, cocktails, whatever, and interview. And I was very fortunate to have conversations with Elon Musk, Elton John, the Pope. So, you know, I've been very fortunate in the people I've been able to converse with. Wow. That's a, that's a brilliant strategy for one. <laughs> um, so it, it, just to kind of recap that. So you're, you're working at the nightclub and you had this idea that you wanted to connect with the, the high rollers that were coming in there. Yep. And so you started basically a, not maybe officially at the time a concierge service, but your idea was in order to connect with them, you wanted to add value, which people always talk about, right? Like add value first. Um, so you you came up with this idea to create these amazing experiences for people, and then you would invite them to these experiences. And then through that, you're almost gaining the goodwill to then follow up with them to do the, the networking or the consulting or the questions that you uh, wanted to know about. Yeah, you say... You say I was doing it not officially. I sold the company, I think, three years ago, something like that. I don't think I ever officially did it. You know, I was working with some of the biggest brands in the planet, but I never, I don't want to say never took it seriously, but it was never my first focus. Let me give you an example. If you walk in and you buy a book on how to lose weight, is the book going to allow you to lose weight or is the actions you take and the byproduct going to be that you've lost weight. Far too many people are poor and therefore they stare at the bank account. You've got to stare at the actions that are going to mean that you don't have to stare at the bank account. I realized that I wanted to have a conversation with affluent people 
Therefore, I had to bring something to the game. So my 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 recourse, my um, my action was to do this in order to get this. So I was kind of never nervous. I was always nervous about kind of having dinner with like, you know, this massively successful person. I got very nervous about those kind of things. Um, but getting nervous about, you know, getting you two front row tickets to Victoria's Secrets Fashion Show or the, you know, Chanel Fashion Week in Paris, those things never really bothered me because they weren't my focus. My focus was over here. So um, I will say I quite will simply, say quite it was simple. it was a very uh, – it wasn't run very well as a business. And I learned, I learned a lot of times – how to run a business by running a bad business. Um, but I was always about the connections. And of course, selling the company and now getting into teaching, training, coaching, and the books, I'm able to take everything I learned from there and just focus on one thing, the power of communication in order to get you closer to the yes in your life. Yeah, I love that. So the power of communication to get closer to the yes uh, why don't we dissect that a little bit? And why don't you tell me what you said before we started recording? Because I think that was a really powerful point about, you know, how communication is kind of easier than ever, but it's almost become like a lost art. Yeah. So here's a here's a, a, a serious joke. Um, I get paid to fly all over the world and to train people in the art of communication. Me, a 245-pound biker from East London. That's hysterical. The reason I get paid so well to train people on communication is because so many people are ignoring it. Now, we just we just got over COVID, okay? We got into COVID, and everyone was bitching and moaning, oh, I can't connect with anyone, I can't get together. We've never, as a society, been able to connect in so many different ways yet have never been more disconnected. Now, I use COVID to be able to make connections. I picked up this thing that I've got. I don't know if anyone else has got it. It's called a phone, and I actually use the bloody thing. I would dial people. And guess what? During COVID, people really wanted the call. Yeah, so everybody, was, picked up, everybody picked up the phone. Everyone picked up that phone. And so yeah. I was doing that. Everyone else is moaning and bitching, and I am just getting, you know, miles and miles ahead of That's conversations that I wasn't able to have earlier because they were on business trips or they were flying or they were in a meeting. There was nobody I couldn't contact because I knew for a fact, just like the rest of the planet, you're at home. You can't be traveling. You can't be having a meeting. You're at home, so I'm going to get you. The dumb thing was people blamed COVID to uh, for ruining the ability for us to connect as human beings. Well, Friendster started that, then MySpace, then Facebook and Twitter and Threads and all of the other countless social platforms of which on any one given day, there's over 500 social platforms. Most people can only name about six or seven, but on any given day, there's over 500 social platforms for you to be able to connect with and communicate on. We went from a society, and I'm not romanticizing it, we went from a society pre-internet where if I had a baby, I'd phone up my mates, we'd all come over, we'd smoke cigars, drink whiskey, look at it, go, great, it's a baby, and then get shit-faced, all right? But now yep. you have a baby, and what's the first thing you do? You take a little picture, you shove it up on Facebook, and you are pissed off, or worse, you fall into a depression if you haven't got a bunch of likes and comments on it, you know, everyone today, they're not seeking conversation. They're seeking approval. I got a thumb up. I got a like, I got a tick. I got a heart. Well, none of that shit can pay my bar tap. So I couldn't understand why everyone was focusing on it. And then COVID came across, which just amplified it. And again, think of COVID a period where apparently we couldn't connect. We, as human beings, created two more societies, two more cultures. We created the gotcha society, and we created the cancel culture. So not only were we getting really bad at communicating before COVID, now we're scared to say anything in case someone takes it out of context and cancels our business. And how many times have you seen those people 
that are on an Olympic hunt to try and find something that you said in 2001 that's ignorant that they can bring up to you now in 2023 and go, oh, my God, I can't believe he said that. Oh, I, he dressed up as a penguin at a, fash, at a fancy dress party. How disrespectful to penguins. Let's cancel him. And we all got scared to communicate. So not mm. only are we bad at communicating because we've been outsourcing it for 20 years now, we're now terrified to communicate in case we say the wrong thing. Mm. That's terrible. And your, your communication is a muscle. Use it or lose it. And if you're okay about being in a transactional society, hey, go and work, hey, for, go Amazon. work for Amazon. But if you want to have a relationship, you've got to focus on the single thing that makes humans humans, the ability to connect. Mm. So let's dive into that a little bit, because obviously relation, uh, real estate is a relationship business. You know, yep. we, we all know that all, all the top realtors get the most amount of business from their sphere of influence, their relationships, things like that. So I really want to kind of uh, pick your brain and kind of learn from you on how we can be communicating better. Uh, and then maybe we can get into the building of the database and, and how to leverage our communication and things like that. All beautiful things and all things that people don't do. They don't focus on building it and they don't focus on leveraging. What's the point of having a really good relationship if you don't leverage it? Now, mm. I know some people are out Very there true. thinking, well, you know, oh my God, that sounds selfish. That sounds rude. How can you leverage? Are you kidding? I'm only in, rev uh, in relationships if they help me grow, if they challenge me, if they make me smile, if they make me laugh. They haven't exactly got to be with the wealthiest people in the planet, but they've got to give something to me. Okay. And so I'm going to start off if, with your permission of telling you a story of one of my coaching clients that's actually a realtor. Um, is, that okay? is that okay? Yeah, that was right. great. So I've been training her because she was doing a lot of sales around uh, in the area that she was. It wasn't very affluent, you know, had some pockets, but most of her sales were like the two fifty to $600,000 mark. All right. And she wanted to get into like the, the one and a half, two and a, a 2.5, 3 million market. Now, now I've, I've spoken at probably the largest real estate conventions in the planet. Okay. And the effort that it takes to sell a $600,000 property ain't much different than selling one for 1 1.8. You know, hey, if you're selling a $100 million property, that maybe takes a little bit of time. But when you're right. in those kind of ballparks, there's not a lot of difference. OK, so I said to her, look, you can spend all your time doing this or you can get into a different sandpit and a different circle of influence and start selling that and effectively do less with more. So we trained her. We spoke to her about how to build up the relationships that we're going to go into in a second. And she started to get into the circles and the sandpits, as I refer to them, that she wanted to be in. And then one day I get a phone call from her. And she said to me, she said, I can't believe it. She said, you know, I'm having a problem. She said, I managed to get the attention of this lady. Now, this lady was a big shot in her town, okay? Mm -hmm. Everyone knew her, most successful, had a whole bunch of businesses, online, offline, bricks and mortars, real estate. She was very, very successful. And she really wanted to look after this woman because she knew that she could leverage the relationships out of that on a referral basis. Mm. But she said, it's all going wrong. And she was in a terrible state. And I said, look, she left me a message. And she was distraught on this message. And I said, look, let's have a call this morning. So I said, what is going on? And she said, well, look, I get this woman's attention. And I said, look, you need anything? You reach out to me. Let me help you. Okay? Mm. And the woman was like, great, fine. She ended up contacting her. And she said, look, I want a three-bedroom house with a swimming pool on this street get it for me. So my client, the realtor, turns around and starts throwing her everything that's got three bedrooms with a swimming pool. And she is, nope, 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 on absolutely everything. And apparently the street wasn't very big. So she even started going door to door to the houses that weren't up for sale saying, hey, can I do a pocket list? And I've got someone that's really interested in this area. Would you be open to and even started throwing it, and it was a no, no, no on everything. She said, I can't believe it. We've basically given her everything on this street exactly what she asked for three bedrooms swimming pool on that and she's saying no to it all i don't know what i'm doing wrong mm. and i said to her i said it's obvious 
It's absolutely startlingly strikingly obvious what you're doing wrong. You are completing a transaction. Now, we all know mm. about this company called Purple Bricks that popped over to try and do the same thing. We'll come back to that in a second. But the point is, you don't want to be a transaction. You know, the client's not always right. The client doesn't know what they don't know. That's your job. I said, and the first thing you did was you started treating this woman as a transaction rather than a relationship. This is where you went wrong. Let's talk about the distinction there. Let's finish the story and we will. There you go. There you go. So I said, this is where you went wrong. You failed to challenge the request on the first conversation. Mm. So this is what you've got to do. Go back to her and go, hey, let's do a reset. And with that reset, I'm also going to start with an apology. I didn't do what I should have done. So I need to change this. And I need to ask you one simple question. Why that street? Now, why has become one of the most confrontational words in the planet? A lot of people say to me, hey, Steve, should we get together for a beer? And I will literally turn around and go, why? And it will... As you, know, as you smile, uh, some people will go, oh, good question. I want to talk to you about this project. Other people will be like, oh, God, he's arrogant. Oh, my God. you know, I only, I was, And you get those kind of resources. But why is a, a, a prodding question? Why do you want that street? Why do you want three bedrooms? Why do you want a swimming pool? Why now? Yeah. So It's a great question. It's a great question, which a lot yeah. of people, once they – think they're in a conversation that they aren't. They're actually just receiving a transactional request, but they think they're in a conversation. They go, I hear you. Thank you. And they run off. And I said, you've got to go back to the lady and ask her. So she did that. She went back to the lady and she went, Hey, got to ask you why, why that area? Why the three bedrooms? Why swimming pool? But why now? And the lady turned around and she said, you know, we lived outside of town. We didn't have much money. And whenever my mum would go anywhere in the car with me, didn't matter if we were going to the mall, if we were going to the dry cleaners, if we were going to church, we would drive down this street. And the reason we would drive down this street was because this was the street that all the people that had made it lived on. Mm. And so as soon as she said that, she realized she wasn't trying to find a house with three bedrooms and a swimming pool. She was trying to show mum that she made it. Now, yeah. in yeah. real estate, we know that the It Street five years ago is no longer the It Street today. Sometimes some of the shittiest areas, look at Soho and the loft areas, they're right. now these multi-million dollar lofts that, you know, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have gone down there at night. Mm-hmm. So when she realized what she was trying to do, which was actually stake her, her flag in an area that said, hey, mom, I've made it. She could go back and go, hey, that's a beautiful street. But you know the it street is this one over here now. And this is where the first house she showed her, she purchased cash. Mm. By challenging her with the why. Yeah. That's a great lesson. Good. Yeah. So um, let's dig a little deeper about uh, on that. How would you say communication wise, or maybe you can just give us some tips like you just did about the digging a little deeper with the why on upfront, things like that to kind of help us uh, bond with clients faster, build rapport faster. Kind of like you talked about, make it a real relationship and make it less transactional. Okay. All right. Perfect. So I learned how to communicate by first of all, communicating really badly. I remember when I was a bricklayer and I had no money, I came out of this pub one night and I was getting on my motorbike and my motorbike, this old shitty Honda would start when it wanted to. And I had two of my other buddies with me and we're both there. We're just about to get on the bike and, you know, play roulette if the bloody thing starts. Um, And all of a sudden this guy turns up in a new car, car pulls in, he gets out. It was almost like a bloody slow motion. He gets his jacket out of the back, puts his jacket on. All my jackets were bloody leather because I was on the bike. He puts a jacket on. All of a sudden, his girlfriend gets out of the car. And I'm thinking, this guy's got everything I want. 
Look at him. This guy is smelling, reeking of success and affluence. Bear in mind, it was a, it was a pub just outside London, so it probably wasn't that. But in my eyes, based on where I was from, a poor bricklayer, this guy had everything. So mm. I, t- I I I literally thought, how come that guy's got everything and I haven't? No word of a lie. I ran at him. I ran at him with every pore pour of aggravation and lust for knowledge. I ran at him and I went, hey, hey, fella, how come you're rich and I'm not? Wow. Now, I was like 19 years old at the time. Um, I've always been a big lad. And you've never seen anyone get in a car and wheel spin out of a car park so fast in your life. This guy was gone like he was on the Formula One starting grid at Vegas. And I turned around to my mates and one of them, no word of a lie, was on the floor because he couldn't stand up because he was crying of laughter so much. And I turned around and I was like, whoa, what's going on? Because I really wanted to know. I wanted to know, what did you do for a living? How come you did this? How did you get into that? But I wanted to know. And they just said, have you seen you? You've just gone running at that guy with a crash helmet in your hand, screaming at him. And I realized then, if you want a good answer, ask a great question. Now, my lust for the knowledge, hey, that was fine. But my delivery, my tempo, my attitude, you know, my visible, everything there was wrong. So I started studying the, the, the art of delivery. And here's a few things you've got to understand when you're, when you're communicating with the client. You first of all got to understand, and like every speaker in the planet knows this, there's the old start, there's the old thing of, you know, if you ask a speaker, you know, what's, what's the number one rule for being a speaker? They'll go, know your audience. Well, mm. as a realtor, know your client. Mm. You can find out more information on your phone about that client the NASA could in 1980s, okay? Mm. So the point is you should use that phone. That's good right there. Oh, yeah. Do your research, okay? Know the, don't turn up and go, hey, how are you? I believe you got a dog called Petsy and two kids, and I believe you had an affair last year. You know, don't start repeating. Don't be a stalker, but just kind of like, if you know that they're into horses, just go, oh, you know, I had I had a funny experience. A couple of months ago, someone tried to get me on a horse. I don't know much about horses. Do you? You know, mm. you can all play that game, okay? So do your research. Know your client, okay? The second thing that all speakers in the planet know that isn't widely talked about is know the temperature of the room. Now, this actually came out of stand-up comedians. Like, if you've ever gone to a rock concert, before the main act, what comes on? Uh, Music. It's the warm-up act, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Right. So, the the artist knows we want to get the audience in the right mood, in the right tempo. Now, you're not going to go up there for, like, I don't know, a a punk concert, and the warm-up band is Taylor Swift. Okay, right. Because <laughs> there's going to be a disconnect. That's back to knowing your audience. <laughs> well, that's back to knowing your audience. But now you've got to know the temperature, and this is where it gets harder. As a speaker, I've walked on stages where the person that's spoken before me has been shit, and mm-hmm. they've depressed the audience. And the audience is now got their phones out, you know, playing Tetris or checking their emails. And I've got to get the audience back before I can elevate them. Now, when you've gone to see a client, you have no idea what phone call they got in the car before they meet you. You've got Mm. no idea whether or not they were having a heated conversation with their partner over the new school fees before they You have no idea about any of that. So check it. Check the temperature, just like you would when you're boiling pasta or when you're jumping into a swimming pool. Start asking, how's your day going? You know, oh, you know, uh, did you have to travel? If How was the traffic? Little probing questions like that. If you start getting the response, you go, oh, God, yeah, yeah, you know, it was all right. Yeah, no, it was uh, just show me the house. Check that temperature, okay? And start, understand the temperature. Now, if you're starting to get that response, 
They don't want flirtatious conversation. They want, hey, by the sounds of it, you're having a hard day. So I don't want to waste your time. So let me get into it. Where's the most important thing for you to be looking at first? Respect yeah. that temperature. They will respect that. Far too often, people think for you to have a good relationship for, with, with a client, you've got to give them everything they want. Well, fuck, you know what you want. You know, you're not in the business. I'm in the business. I'm going to help you yeah. get the best thing that you need for your situation, your family. Have the balls to stand up with the authority and expertise that you've worked really hard for. So yeah. you've got to probe. Now, as you're probing, these people will realize you're trying to connect. You, you are trying to do so. And they will start giving you more. And you can go, thank you. Let's let's have a look. Do you know, based on the conversations we're having, let's save time. This is not the place for you. There's a place just down the road. Let me make a call and see if we can get in there immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Show that you are the link that they needed. You've got to that. probe with the questions. You're not mm -hmm. Amazon. Now, Purple Bricks came over here to try and do that. And they failed. Or did they? Or did they go back to Europe with their tails between their legs with a ton of information that they are secretly working on now only to come back and try again? So if you're okay with transactions, get ready for everyone to put you out of business. But if you want communication, connectivity, and clients and relationships, which then turn into your marketing front line, you got to start with those probing questions. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I, I love what you said about kind of taking their temperature. Because to your point, if they're having, you know, if they're in a great mood and everything's great, that's a totally different conversation than if they're having a tough day and how you approach that and how uh, also like their personality styles. Some people like a lot more information. Some people, they don't want to see the steak. They just want to eat it. Um, so you got to know the audience there as well. So do you have any probing questions that, that you recommend or, uh, that we could I, implement before you speak? Look, okay. Look at the body language. Now I was a doorman and I used to play the game as kind of like, you know, who's looking for trouble, who's celebrating a first night, who's on a first date, who's celebrating a girl's night out. And I would right. look at that body language and interaction. As they got towards the door, I'd be like, good evening. Uh, why are you here tonight? You celebrating anything? Oh, yes. It's, you know, it's the girls get together. And I'll be like, in my head, I'll be like, yeah, I got that right. Oh, we're celebrating a new job. Yeah, I got that right. Oh, actually, it's, it's our first date. Oh, you have a great time. Would you like me to set you up a private table somewhere so you can talk a bit more? Yeah, I would be able to guess it because I would look and I would check out the body language. Okay. The body language is telling you more than the voice will because the voice may be trying to kind of hide it. Yeah, we're great. We're having a great time. Nope, there's no problem here. You know I'm lying here, you know, yeah. because the tonality is wrong. So before you speak, look, if you want to see this in practice and if you want to get a Harvard education on how to gauge this quickly, Go to a high-end cocktail bar and watch the staff. Okay. I am telling you, quite simply, bar staff are some of the best at this in the planet because they've got six people in front of them, okay? And they all want cocktails. And they're all looking at the cocktail waiter, waitress, mixologist, whoever it is. And they, based on the body language, the dress, the, the the stature, how they're holding themselves, you watch them. They will go, oh, good afternoon, sir. You know, can, How can I help you? Oh, you want – let me just get those. And they're like, evening, ladies. How can I help? They will change their tonality between these six people in a split second. You've got to be able to do it. There's actually a guy – I'm, I'm going to give him a, a shallow plug here because he deserves it. In fact, maybe we should get him on your show. Brian Golk. He's a facial recognition expert, and he Ooh. runs a company called Subtle Skills. And he can literally look at people and tell what's going on in your life, whether you've got sad news, whether you're happy, based on your facial expressions. Because apparently, you, the muscles in your face react to what your brain's going through. 
Wow. And he knows how to pick up on it. It's really incredible to see it. But here's the dumb thing. I like Brian, but he's kind of ripping us off. And the reason I say he's ripping it off, and I mean this in a good way, is that we knew all of this shit when we were little kids. When we were little kids, we knew who to play with in the playground, who to mess with, who was the bully of the school. We knew all of these things. And right. then as we got older, our ability to recognize and to trust our gut went away. And a lot of the time now, we're trusting our eyeballs. Well, you know, how many times as realtors, well, that person's got an expensive car. Yeah, surely they must be able to afford this house only to find out that they've got no money and it's that brother's car. So the bottom line of it is now we're trusting our eyes too much when we should be trusting our gut. And we need to look at the person, ask questions like, why now? That's always a good question. Okay. Oh, you're looking for, why is now important? You know, mm -hmm. find out, is there a job transfer? Are they splitting up and they need separate houses? You know, have they decided to downsize because money's a bit tight? You know, find out why now. A lot of realtors won't ask that question. And it's a great probing question to find out what's going on in your life that I can react to. Totally agree. Yeah. The question based approach, I think, is always the best because. Again, A, you're not going to be talking as much and you're going to be listening more. And you're to your point, you're going to be able to uncover those little nuggets that they give you along the way that you can now weave back into your presentation. Because again, like you said, if someone, you know, if a couple splitting up, that's a completely different conversation than, you know, the older couple that's looking to downsize or the young family that just had another kid that needs to needs to get a bigger place and and so asking those probing questions i think is is uh is huge um i would definitely recommend anybody check out steve's books if you want to go deeper on this blue fishing and go for stupid and then also any any books you can find on question based selling and that'll give you a lot of really great tips and awesome questions to ask as you're kind of building relationships with people um so on that note let's talk about the next step, which is kind of like the building of the database, right? Because in real estate, you know, building a database is the best way to get referrals. It's the best way to get repeat business. It's the best way to grow your business. It's tried. It's true. It's only worked in every market since the beginning of time. Um, so let's talk about kind of how to build a, a database and, and how to approach it. Because what it's not is it's not oh, I just met you and I got your business card and now I'm going to put you into my autoresponder and maybe I'll call you once a year. Um, so let's let's talk about your philosophies on really building a strong database to get referrals and build your business. It's the toughest and most rewarding thing, mm -hmm. but it's also heavily confused and you've just aligned to it straight away there. A lot of people will think it's a numbers game. You know, as long as I'm going to networking events, as long as I'm going to the local Better Business Bureau event and I'm getting as many business cards as possible and I'm sliding them into my uh, autoresponders, everything's good. Stop trying to get numbers. Start trying to get connections. Okay? That's yes. the key. That's in it yes. there. Okay? Yes. Pay attention. Okay? Now, I've gone to people's meetings before when I had the concierge firm and I would just chat down. And again, because I've done a little bit of delving on who they are, I kind of had a little bit of an idea of what they like. You may see them at the beach. You may see them on holiday. They may see them with three kids. You may see them with horses or at an award show or a gala or with a fancy car. And I, I can go in there and I can start dropping these questions in about, you know, um, I'm glad that we got the chance to meet. I believe you were away a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, business or pleasure? You know it was a holiday. But they would go, oh, I was, I was on holiday. Oh, really? Well, where'd you go this time? I went over to, you know, Seychelles. Never been to the Seychelles. Is it, is it worth it? Is it all it's cracked up to me? Start going into that. Do you travel much? Yeah, I do. One of my little things that I used to do was after my meeting, I would send them a travel plug adapter. Now, you can go on Amazon and you can pick those things up for like about four bucks. If you buy them in bulk, you know, you can even get them cheaper than that, you know? 
And I would send it. I'd say, oh, I was pleased to chat with you last. I know we spoke about travel. Do you know, I travel a fair bit. And the thing that's always bothered me is when I get to my location and I don't have a plug adapter. And, of course, I can't yep. plug my phone in. Or and it's the most annoying thing. I wanted to save you that headache. Please take this as a little gift, as appreciation for taking the time to talk with me. That's awesome. And I, and I would drop them that. I'll tell you one that really did well for me. Absolutely. The ROI was just off the freaking chart. 9-11 happened. And what was the one thing we were not allowed to fly with anymore? Anything metal. Remember right. that? You know? Yeah. You would go to airports and they would give you plastic forks to eat a steak. You know? You could suddenly no longer get a knife or anything metal on board. And so I was working with affluent clients a lot and affluent clients like good things, but they still travel. So what I did was I went onto Amazon and I bought a pack of four shoehorns in plastic. Okay. Okay. Four plastic shoehorns. I remember it cost me like nine bucks for four of the bloody things. Okay. I would wrap one of them. Send it to the client and go, hey, I know you're traveling a lot. You get on the plane. You love to kick your shoes off. But then all of a sudden, you're just about to land again. Your feet have swollen up. You don't want to ruin the backs of a good pair of shoes. But you can't take your metal shoehorn on anymore because of 9-11 rules. Here's a plastic one to protect your shoes. That's great. Now, it's just a little novel thing. Two things. One, it's cheap. Two, it shows you pay attention to the fact that they're traveling and you yeah. pay attention to the other thing. Good affluent people wear good shoes. Okay. Cause they have standards. If you can pay attention to the standards, no matter how small they are, then everything else will work. The people used to introduce me. I'm not kidding. You, I went to this party and this guy that, um, God, I don't know how many jets he owned. And I'm not kidding you. It was like 12 jets, 12 private jets. It's just ridiculous. Why do you need 12 jets? But anyway, he had all these kind of stuff. He introduced me to the people at the party as the shoehorn guy. Now. I love it. <laughs> yeah. You, you may think, well, I'm a realtor. I don't want to be introduced as a shoehorn guy. You've got the guy throwing the party, one of the richest people at the party going, this guy pays attention. Yeah, you know, this is what he does. Now, bear in mind that guy, I had actually got him a private meet and greet with Elton John and a play piano. But before he gets into that story, he would introduce me as the shoehorn guy. Yeah, that's awesome. Hey, what a great fantastic. thing. And then what's cool about that too is now the person he introduced you to, you've automatically got a story to talk about. The amount of people yeah. that would literally come up to me and go, why did Roger introduce you as the shoehorn guy? Right. You know, and I'd be like, oh, it was, it was a little thing that we did and a little thing. Everybody, and this is something now, you know, back five years ago, back 10 years ago, back 15 years ago, attention to detail was the norm. You know, you'd bump into the street. Hey, how's Johnny? How's the little kids getting on? How's your mom? Your mom was sick. How we don't have those conversations. When was the last time you walked down the street, bumped into your neighbor, and you went, hey, how you doing? How's Nancy? You just don't do it now. The art of conversation, sadly, is dying. But if you can show that you are the one that pays attention to the small shit, those people want you in, your, in that world. And then mm. when they introduce you, they go, this person. People will literally introduce me as Steve gets in. He gets into what you need, and then he helps you get where you need to be. The guy's got standards. He's got detail. He's got a ten this is how I'm introduced now to coaching clients. That's is there any – Is there, exactly. Why buy Facebook ads when surely the people that are spending money with you should be your front line of marketing? And if they're mm -hmm. not, it's your fault. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think that uh, that word of mouth that you created by just giving a simple gift, uh, that's something we talk about a lot too, is just gifting and doing, you know, lumpy mail, things like that. Yeah. Just things that will stand out that people aren't doing these days anymore. And to your point, now 
A, you created a great relationship with the rich guy. B, now the rich guy who's throwing the parties is introducing you as a important person or someone that is worth talking to. Yep. And to your point, yep. that becomes then your front line of marketing. And now you're getting you're getting deals, you're getting business, you're getting opportunities, and it's all free to your point. You're not buying this. You spent three bucks on a plastic shoehorn and now you've got uh, you know a good relationship and a good story for life. Absolutely. You mentioned about lumpy mail. I write a ton of that in uh, in my first book, Blue Fishing. Um, but I'll give you a little tidbit, which is really, really good, okay? Because a lot of people that you want to connect with have secretaries or partners to basically read the mail before it gets to the person, correct? Yes. And a lot of the questions that I get is, how do you get past the gatekeeper? Yeah. Here's a little tip for you, and you're going to love this one. All go, right. go to a local high-end hotel. Go into the hotel, walk up to the concierge, let them know that you're going to be writing some letters to some very affluent clientele of yours, and you need 20 envelopes and 20 pieces of stationery. Okay. From that hotel. Okay. When you send a letter to your prospect or your client, and it comes from such and such hotel, the gatekeepers go, well, I won't open this. It must be personal. Because who else mm. would send a letter from the Ritz Carlton in so-and-so or the W Hotel in New Orleans? And it's hand-addressed, okay? And it's been posted. And here's the key. Here's the key. You're going to overlook it, but it's powerful. When you put the stamp on the top right-hand corner, Squiff it over slightly. Okay. Put it on crooked. <laughs> put it on crooked. Why? Yeah. Because machines put things on perfectly and we don't trust perfection. So show it to human being from a hotel, handwrite the envelope. That little baby will get through every single time. The amount of people I've gone, yeah, I got this envelope from such as, and, and I just recently did a, um, a uh, speakeasy that my masterminds and I did one in New Orleans. And the first thing I did when I landed was I went down to the concierge and I said, I need 50 envelopes and 50 pieces of stationery. So my prospects and my clients get these envelopes from there and they get, they get passed through because no one knows who would be sending it other than a friend or someone close. And that's what you want. Right. To that's genius. I love that. And what an easy tip, right? Like anytime you go anywhere, Get that stationary, and you can use it forever. I was just out here at the Ritz Carlton. I thought of you. Da 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 da. da. Here's a yeah. nice letter. Yeah, and and I've often put it like when you go to the concierge, you also get the uh, the little walking maps of the local area, don't you? Okay. Yeah. So shove one of those in there, saying, "Hey, I just came back. I'm just in New Orleans. I was thinking about you." By the way, send me an email when we can both talk or send me a text when we can both call, talk. But if you're ever thinking of going to New Orleans, I've just highlighted three restaurants on this walking map that I can vouch for. They were really good. And shove it in there. And it gives you that lumpy feel of the mail, but it gives them something a little bit cool to talk about. And then they will text you. And the amount of times I've had people text me going, oh, thank, oh, I love New Orleans. Oh, I loved Oh, I didn't see that. I didn't know about that restaurant. Or, oh, did you go here? And you start off a conversation. Yeah. And that's, isn't, isn't that what we want? At the end of the day, isn't what we want is that connection and conversation? Anything can mm -hmm. happen from there. Yeah, and I love what you're saying because it builds relationships from a genuine place, right? Yep. It's not, oh, I'm just like, you know, like we said earlier, I, I, I'm not just putting you in my autoresponder and sending you junk mail. I'm putting a little bit of extra thought in it to take it that little bit further to show a that I care, b that I'm paying attention, c that I'm you know adding value and all of those things. So yep. I love that. Those are some really great tips as well. Um, I want to circle back to to the building of the database and not. Uh, I love what you said. Is it's not a numbers game. Like I've always said this as well. I'd rather have a hundred people on my database. And you can literally just start with your wedding list if you're married, right? There's your database to start. Uh, but everyone knows at least 50 to 100 people. And if you can grow that organically over time with the right connections, 
which I think is something that you you kind of talk about a lot is uh, getting the right connections as opposed to just that. Ma I don't want to have a thousand people on my database that don't know me, don't remember me, uh, just so that I can feel good about having a big database. I want to have a database of people that know me, like me, trust me, and refer me business. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you've answered it all. You know, building up a network is something that you've got to do with purpose. It's not mm -hmm. something that you just wander down going, oh, give me a card. Oh, I've got another number in the motor day. Move with purpose. Move with direction. If I'm at an event and I can get the most powerful per person in the room into a conversation, then I can get them into a connection then I can get them into a relationship, then I can get them into a referral source. That one person is going to get the attention of the room and send it back to me, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't want to scout around that room going, oh, can I have your business card? Oh, thank you very much. I'll give you a call. I don't want any of that shit. I personally hate networking. The definition of hell to me is going to a networking event. But if I'm forced to go to it, I'm going to look for the pinnacle. I'm going to look for that person just running the thing. I'm going to look for that person. I'm going to go up there and go, oh, you threw a fantastic event tonight. Congratulations. You've created a really good room here. Yeah, you know, and just mm. start getting into a conversation with him. And then he'd be like, oh, what are you doing? Me? Oh, I'm a, you know, a hand model. And I'm looking at getting into more modeling gigs. Oh, have you met Johnny? No, I haven't. Now you've got the person of the room introducing yeah. you. You know, that's what you should do. Let somebody else do the work. Mm. that's a really great tip right there. I love the idea of going to the host of the event, the party, the seminar, the whatever it is, uh, giving them some love, giving them some flowers about their event. Hey, great event. Da, 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 da. Uh, and then what other things would you say to that person to kind of, uh, you know, do what you said and, and kind of get them to be an advocate for you? I always find that a lot of people are really excited to go to the event. So a lot of the bullshit and blowing smoke out of their ass happens before the event. Oh, I'd love to come to your event. Oh, can, can I go? Oh, you throw a great event. Oh, congratulations. Very few people follow up afterwards. They wait until Very another true. event's coming up. So what I always do is I always follow up with someone after the event, even if I haven't been to the event. You know, I've had a lot of people talk to me as though I was at the event. But I followed up with them after the event going, hey, you threw a great event. Congratulations. I need to ask, is there anything that I could do to help you make it better for the next one? Or did it do everything you wanted it to do? Was there any areas that maybe I could help you with through my Rolodex? Now, your Rolodex may be weak, but hey, I get the idea you're a strong person. You can find a way of getting someone to meet somebody and start offering the help post the event and they they never get those calls they get that yeah. oh thanks johnny i met loads of people made loads of money out of the event but very rarely do they get people going hey you threw a fantastic event throwing a good event is no easy thing and you That's did true. a great job at it yeah but how can i help you make the next one better you may mm. even come in as a co-host how cool would that be? You're now the one that's, you're now the gatekeeper. I love and, that. And, and I love, how can I help you make this event better? That's a great question. Yeah, everyone wants to make their event better. So, you know, showing that you care. And as I say, you may not even have been at the event, but you may get closer. I'll tell you, that attitude and those questions is what got me an eight-year contract with Elton John's Oscar party. By literally going, hey, great event. But how could next year's be better? How could next year's be easier? How could next year's be more profitable with the right kind of attendance? Mm -hmm. By me asking, again, those probing questions, they were like, great question. I hadn't thought about that. What would you have done? It's funny you should ask that. You know, I remember when I started, they were charging three and a half grand a ticket to go to Sir Elton John's Oscar party. I said, anyone can spend three and a half grand, which means not everyone that's in the room should be, you know, let's make the cheapest ticket five and a half or six and a half grand. And they were like, but if we do that, we won't get as many people. Correct. You'll have mm. less catering cost. You'll have less alcohol beverage, but you'll have less people paying you more money. 
your net gain will be more. And when you do the auction, you'll have the right kind of people in the room that can spend more. They did it. Yes. In fact, in exactly. fairness, they didn't do it the first year. They kind of shunned the idea. But the second year, they took a belt on it. And um, they ran it for another six years with the higher price guy, uh, uh, pri higher price market. There you go. Simple, simple. And those are the most impactful. Everything simple is impactful. Everything complicated mm -hmm. is boring, tiring, and no one wants to do it. Yeah, I think the big takeaways for me today were, one, just the authenticity and how you're communicating. Uh, B, I love the just strategies you shared about quickly building relationships, rapport, things like that. And just that it's not a numbers game and it's about just building authentic connections. And I think you shared a, a bunch of really great ways to do that. A um, couple questions I like to wrap with is – I have two young boys at home. They're six and eight years old. And I always like to ask the successful people that I get to talk to, what would you say to the next generation about being successful in life and business? You can download an app that will show you how to build a bridge, um, probably even do open heart surgery. But there is still no app that is going to help you communicate authentically between two human beings. So focus on the art of communication. When you're in a coffee shop, compliment someone's shoes. Ask someone a question. I'm telling you now, the ability to converse with someone is going to be what's going to set you apart. Love that. And so true because that, you know, it's the fund, it's the foundation for everything. It's the foundation for building relationships, you know, sales, um, yep. marketing. I mean, it literally, the communication piece is is by far the most important. So I love that. And then just as a final question, in 60 seconds or less, what does it take to be an expert at communication? Failing. To be an expert in absolutely everything, you first of all got to suck at it. It's your drive and your aggravation to keep going, which is going to refine you into becoming that expert. But I would also defy people, don't be an expert, be a student. I'm really mm. good at these things because I'm a really good student and I'm constantly refining and pushing it and sharpening the sword every single time. I love that. That's a great way to end right there. Uh, great piece of advice. And uh, I like the concept of just failing and sharpening the ax and coming back for more. Yep. I think that's a beautiful way to think about it. Um, Steve, for anybody that wants to contact you, how can they, uh, how can they learn more? How can they connect? Uh, I'm Steve D. Sims everywhere. Don't forget the D for dashing, and there's only one M in Sims. You can jump on Steve D. Sims on Instagram, Twitter, anywhere that you consume. Probably most vocal on Instagram if you want to send me a message. If you do send me a, a DM, let me know that you heard me on this podcast. All right? Show some love. Um, but at the same time, if you want to go over to my website, stevedsims.com, you can find out about my private community, Sims Distillery, all the books. Or if you want the book, for free, then go to goforstupid.com where you can actually watch me video talk the uh, the book for you. I actually did a video series because I wanted the audio, and then we ended up with all the videos, didn't know what to do with them, so we've given the book away for free. Stick it on in the corner while you're doing your work in the day. Yeah, I love that. That's a massive value, guys. That's free. You can get his brand new book yep. for free. Just go to goforstupid.com. And uh, as always, guys, if you have any questions, put them in the box down below. Make sure you like, subscribe, share all the things. And as always, if you like money and you like real estate, this is the show for you. And we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, Steve.